Hey YouTube, this is Nas here for the seventh episode of Duelist's Almanac. Today we're talking about gamesmanship. Now what exactly is gamesmanship? Well, it's about being a good player. That doesn't really help us. What does it mean to be a good player? What well, doesn't mean, you know, just following the rules of basic hygiene, basic etiquette, you know, asking to see your uh, opponent's cards to read them, things of that nature. Um, it's about doing little things, like um, being always sure of the score, you know, keeping track of life points. Also, it's about reading your opponents and, um, you know, getting information, using your opponent as a resource. Now, how can you use your opponent as a resource? Well, um, just for example... Uh, say you know your opponent's playing Dark World, and they set a bunch of face downs on their back row, and then set one card face down. Uh, a monster. Well, what do you think that monster is? It's probably Morphing Jar. In fact, if any um, if any Dark World players just set a card, set a monster face down, and that's it, I'd like guarantee it's going to be like a Morphing Jar. Or the other thing is, is the Dark World player might know this, and they might be um, bluffing you and and to being afraid of a Sangin or something of that nature. So it's about being able to read the opponents, and it's also about always making the correct plays. Now, while a few videos ago I just showed you some basic formulas for creating monsters um, with my Synchro deck, um, it's also important to figure out what or to evaluate those uh, formulas, to evaluate those plays, and figure out um, which plays are the most appropriate at any given time. Um, so basically. It's about using your mind or using your head and thinking and being an active player uh, mentally uh, when you play someone. Um, the idea is while you might be restricted um, by what's physically in your hand and your uh, board position or uh, your game position, you know, and your advantage of what cards you have face up, face down, things of that nature on the field, and what cards you have in your hand. Your mind is something your opponent can't really control. It should always be probing, it should always be looking at things, it should always be checking the graveyard, checking the remove from play zone, seeing if your opponents use their gores, use their mirror force, use their solemn judgments, anything big that can give you more information. Because really, this is a game about information, not just about knowing your deck more than your opponent knows theirs, but it's about knowing um, what plays you can do, what things you can get away with. For example... Say my opponent has um, no cards on the field, I have a huge monster, my opponent has a bunch of cards in hand. Um, if I want to attack, well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check their graveyard, see if they've used their gorge yet. Um, if they haven't, then I'll, I'll be making preparations as I'm playing to deal with that gores. Um, such as attacking with my smallest monsters first, then working up to the big monster. That way if my opponent drops gores, I can just run over their token. Not that big of a deal. Um, however, if they have used their gores, I won't be as worried about it. Um, but they could be running uh, battle faders, things of that nature. Another thing that's important about um, gamesmanship and how to increase yours is uh, know your meta. For example, um, when I talked about side decking uh, yesterday, um, I wasn't side decking against samurai decks. I wasn't necessarily side decking against um, Machina or Karakuri. That's because the people who I play with don't really use those decks. Um, so you want to definitely tailor your side deck. You want to tailor your um, your game style, I guess, to going against um, specific decks in the meta, the ones that you face most often. Um, however, this is, of course, a challenge when you play at regionals or go to nationals or go to YCSs or whatever because you're going to be seeing a whole bunch of decks. But you can help remedy that by taking a look at you know what cards are uh, currently valued very high, uh, what cards people are using, what trends are going around in the overall game. For example, a lot of people are using Tour Guide, right? Now I don't have to play people regularly who use Tour Guide to be prepared to know to be prepared for Tour Guide um, or those type of expensive plays. I mean, uh, a lot of us are pretty poor college students, so I don't see a lot of people when I play using Tour Guide but I can still expect to see it because I know people use that. That's the current trend right now. That's part of the reason why it's so high is because it's so good. So being able to analyze not only the meta, but your own deck is very important um, with gamesmanship. Uh, another thing, even though I kind of pushed it aside er earlier in this video, is definitely you know show respect to not only your cards, but your opponent's cards. 
I mean, even if they're not showing any respect, uh, like their cards are all bent up or not in sleeves or they don't have a mat or something, you should still show them the common courtesy of, you know, asking if you can see their, um, their things to read their effects and um, waiting for your opponent to put everything in grave. Um, it's just part of the golden rule of Yu-Gi-Oh, I guess. Treat your cards, or treat your opponent's cards as you'd like your cards to be treated. So that's um, pretty much all the straight-up notes that I have uh, in relation to gamesmanship. Um, your level of gamesmanship will definitely increase um, the more people you play and the more variety of decks you play. And that goes, um, that also stands true, or rings true, for things like uh, card analysis, set evaluation, uh, things of that nature. Basically, just uh, use your brain, be aware of everything. Just because your deck is like Machina or something that you can go into autopilot doesn't mean that uh, you yourself mentally can rest on, on your laurels. Um, in fact, autopilot's good for um, increasing your gamesmanship because you already basically know how your deck's going to function in any given situation. So you can use you know um, that the remainder of that mental energy, I guess, or um, that attentiveness to probe your opponent... Um, with your minds and you know gauge what they're going to do for example um, if you know what their deck archetype is you pretty much have a good idea what big plays they're going to have for example dark world pretty much always going to spam graffa um, so you can deal with that you can know when to save your dimensional prisons your bottomless trap holes things of that nature um, if you're playing against uh, karakuri you know you know they're going to go uh, burai burrito um, and then spam those or if you know if um, you're playing against somebody who runs a Light Sworn or Chaos based deck, even Chaos Stun, you know that eventually Black Luster Soldier or Chaos Sorcerer is going to come out. So you can plan for those things. Um, so you plan basically for um, the worst of your opponent's monsters, I guess, and you need to meet them. Um, throughout all of my playing, I've, just, I've kind of realized um, that games pretty much fall into three big categories, um, three phases. There's the um, the scout phase where you and your opponent are still feeling each other out. Um, they're starting you and it's early game. You and your opponent are starting to set up basic foundation plays, like you're still playing gadgets and they're still um, playing. I don't know. Um, they just played their uh, quacky marrow drago, so you can't summon any lights or darks. Um, the scout phase is basically seeing what you and your opponent are willing to commit to. Um, and looking at what common plays they're going to do. Uh, a key scout play um, for my uh, plant deck is I set a Raiko. That's pretty much it. Um, but that doesn't last long. Then you have the battle phase. That's probably the longest phase. The battle phase is where you and your opponent are generating all your big monsters and going for big plays, and um, that's usually for mid-game to late-game. So that's things like uh, removing stuff to summon your Red-Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon. Um, I start sinking fives and um, sixes and sevens and eights. Um, basically, you and your opponent are using your strongest things and slugging it out. Like, I summon a big monster, and I attack you, you activate Mirror Force, and, you know, um, we're just slugging it out back and forth. So that's the battle phase. Then you have the pursuit phase. Um, now, the pursuit phase is where 98% of the games are won. Um, it's very, it's pretty difficult, well, it's not super difficult to make a comeback in Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, not as much as it is in Magic or um, Warhammer, but... Uh, when, when you're entering the pursuit phase, it's when your opponent's been critically weakened, uh, so either their hand's depleted, they can't um, keep up with you know your hand control and your, your plussing, or they don't have any good monsters out, or maybe they're drawn into a bunch of terrible resources that they can't really use. Like, drawing into DD Crows isn't really going to help you when your opponent has a Graffa staring you in the face. Um, so, either, either player's going to either make an error... Or lose a big monster, or give it up to a trap like the Mirror Force, or just not be being able to keep the production of monsters or maintain uh, board control or field control. Okay, once that happens, then um, whoever, pl whichever player um, has the ability to maintain field control, maintain hand control, and be make sure that they have a bunch of monsters, well, then they're going to win basically, uh, unless you know the opponent is playing heroes and draws into a Miracle Fusion and then goes for Absolute Zero. Um, th there's, and only a few decks can make a comeback, um, from the pursuit phase. And even after that, since your, um, your level of monster production and stuff is so high, um, as well as your other resources, 
uh, okay, that miracle fusion might hurt you, you know, might cause you to lose something once you finally have an answer for the absolute zero. Um, but uh, you, you'll still have a bunch of other things that you can still hit the opponent with. Um, so in the pursuit phase, we see our highest or our um, our highest drop or um, our highest decreases in life points. Um, well, that could be something like an early solemn judgment might stop the opponent or a few solemn warnings. Um, but you're going to see most of your direct attacks occur during your pursuit phase, and the pursuit phase basically ends games. Now, with all of that um, being said, uh, I'd like to take um, this opportunity to talk about uh, just something uh, I saw today on the uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! wiki um, as an example of gamesmanship and things. So they've released, um, or they've, the, they've kind of come out uh, for, I think, Power Pack 14, um, in Japan, yeah, Premium Pack 14, um, there's a little something called Mast Hero Acid. Now, it's eight stars, Warrior Fusion Effect, uh, water, uh, attribute, uh, and the text is, must be special summoned with mass change, cannot be special summoned by other ways. When this card is special summoned, destroy all spell and trap cards your opponent controls, and all phase-up monsters your opponent controls lose 300 attack. It's uh, 26, uh, 100 attack, and 21 uh, defense. Now, being a guy who plays, or at least used to play, I mean, I still have it around. I'm still looking at it, I guess. But it's not my main deck by any means. Um, uh, absolute zero deck. Uh, this is why I'd be running Mass Chain, so I could go into um, Acid, um, use uh, Absolute Zero's effect, nuke my opponent's monsters, and then hit their spells and traps as well. The problem is... Um, by doing that, you're burning a lot of resources because you need the Miracle Fusion, then you need to give up the Absolute Zero, then you need to play Mass Change, and then you need to play um, uh, Acid off of that. Uh, also, uh, you're giving up some opportunities. By having um, Acid in your extra deck, you're giving up a slot that could be um, used by a more commonly used or utilized Exceed or, or more powerful Synchro Monster. Um, so you're giving. There's a trade-off. Um, this game is a game of trade-offs, um, and plus it's only 26 attacks, so I'm not really worried. The other thing is, is um, as soon as you have that Ab Zero out, um, your opponent's going to be pretty much ready if they're good to take a tactical, I, I guess, a tactical defeat to uh, su succeed strategically. They'll lose a monster. They'll play Smashing Ground. They'll deal with the Ab Zero. Um, but then as soon as Mass Change hits. Um, there are still a few ways to take care of um, the acid. First off, <laughs> there's a few hard counters, like Puppet Plant. I'll just grab your Puppet Plant, um, the end phase of this turn. So Puppet Plant can be used um, during any player's turn. I can have a Doom Cow out and just make sure that um, the effects never never occur. The uh, Compulse, while that won't save me from the, um, the Ab Zero effect, I can still chain the um, Compulse to the Summon, or not really the Summon, but once um, Acid is out and um, he, he uses his effect to start blowing up my spells and traps, I can just chain the Compulse. So, okay, he'll hit my spell and trap, but you'll, your opponent will lose this um, big monster that they just played. And you can always Starlight Road, since it is uh, a multiple destruction effect if you're overextended. So I'll just negate them, basically. Um, also, with the advent of this, um, I was thinking about using... Uh, more uh the solemn trio using solemn warning negating the summon of the uh or not even negating the summon just negating the miracle fusion um also you can use dd crow to control the grave so they don't have any ammunition that they can use for miracle fusion also it's 26 attack i can countersink next turn for something a lot larger and um they attack into this field that they've just cleared um i have gores in hand i'll drop gores or uh, you nuked my field, now I suddenly have exactly three darks in Grave. I'll play Dark Arm Dragon. So, uh, I mean, hero decks aren't topping right now. Um, and, I mean, it'll be interesting to see once uh, Acid comes out, you know, how that changes the, the way that heroes work. But I tried to work heroes for, like, quite a long time. Basically, this whole summer I tried to work heroes, and it just didn't work out. So I, I don't think Acid's going to have any main change. I mean, there's hard counters and soft counters. I just showed you some. I mean, there's some other stuff, like... Uh, I can debunk. There's, well, hmm, doesn't activate in Hand or Grave. All right, out of this extra deck. See, I'm not really tailored to Warriors because I don't have a problem with them or E-Heroes. 
Um, what I'm actually kind of scared of is um, once the Dark Hero comes out, Iskardow, um, and they just super poly all my guys. But enough about that. So that's just a little example of gamesmanship and analyzing cards and things. So thanks for tuning in to this seventh episode of Duelist Almanac about gamesmanship. Uh, tomorrow we'll be talking about um, how to analyze sets and figure out what's good. And thanks for watching. I'll see you later. Peace.